So now we define economics. Let's define managerial economics. So the only the only thing here is that the um, you have to add in who the manager is, and this is just anyone who makes decisions for the business firm. Okay, so managerial economics is the study of how to direct scarce resources O U R C S to meet the goals of the business firm. Okay, so that's a pretty simple definition. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I do want to think about the goal of the business firm, though. So in our, in our simple model of business firms, we say the goal is to maximize profit. where profit is the difference between revenues and cost. And we say that, uh, or we, we're going to use the symbol pi as, um, as profit. And that's a universal uh, symbol. You've, uh, I'm sure you saw it in your whatever economics courses you've had prior to this one. So profit is the difference between total revenue and total cost. And in symbols, we'll be using TR for total revenue and C for cost, for total cost. And sometimes we will make these um, functional relationships where revenue, just single letter now, but it's the same thing as total revenue, depends on uh, the amount produced and cost also depends on the amount produced. So profit is a function of price. Sorry. Profit is a function of the amount produced. And in this simple model, this means that Q is the decision variable. Okay, so <clears throat> um, we can expand on this thing and make uh, profit, put that on the left-hand side, and sometimes I get sloppy with my notation, and I'm going to leave off the Q, but we know that profit is a function of whatever is on the right-hand side of this equation. So um, revenue, we can expand the concept of that to be equal to price times quantity. Okay, and cost, um, we'll just leave it as C of Q at this point. Okay, we could think of uh, quantity, and it depends on labor, capital, and natural resources. Okay, and you can think that um, you can make the cost more complicated by plugging in, thinking about how Q depends on labor, capital, and natural resources and their input prices and how all that is embodied in the uh, cost function. And we're going to be doing that and it's, uh, doing a lot of that in Chapter 5. Right, so we're going to hold off on talking about that, but I do want to Think a little bit more about price and quantity over here. This, 
this formulation of revenue has price as a constant. Okay, it doesn't depend on anything. This is the type of business firm that's called a price taker. Um, it has no control over its price, and that's because this business firm um, faces a lot of uh, competition from other firms. Competition from other firms. And what we observe is that some business firms in some markets, when there's a lot of other competitors out there producing a similar product, um, if they raise their price by a little, consumers will move over to another product and, um, and the consumers will be just as happy as before. So business firms don't have a lot of pricing power. Okay, when there is, when there's less competition, Okay, the profit equation is going to be more complicated. Okay, price is going to depend on quantity. And then we'll multiply that by the quantity produced. And I'll just keep quantity simple. But we do know that it depends on the production of labor cap, uh, the production function and the purchases of labor capital and natural resources. So here, this is a simple model of price determination, okay, we'll develop some ideas that uh, um, uh, clue us in to the fact that there's a negative relationship between price and quantity. And that's, gonna, we're going to call that the law of demand next chapter. And that means that if the business firm sells more of its product, then it's probably going to have to lower its price. Okay, so let's don't lose track of, uh, don't let me lose track of what I'm saying. Um, in defining managerial economics, we're going to study how managers direct scarce resources to maximize profit. And the direction of those resources are embodied in these decisions that I've um, laid out here. Okay, we have to make production decisions and that decisions and that involves uh, the cost of those inputs and then if the business firm is not a price taker then the manager has to make decisions about price the, uh, the price to charge and the quantity to produce Economists also have a, uh, a slightly different way of thinking about profits. Um, okay, we think in terms of economic profits. Okay, and let's contrast that to accounting profits. Okay, the, the difference is that in, uh, with accounting profits, we only include explicit cost of production in the calculation of the profit. And that's because, well, we call it accounting profits because that's what accountants do. You've got a balance sheet and you've got numbers on the left and numbers on the right. I'm a terrible accountant, um, uh, but I think this is right. This is correct. Numbers on the left and the right, and on the left you've got, I mean, those are debits and credit, credits, right? But all the numbers that you write down are actual, um, most of them are actual transactions, and then you can get complicated and start talking about depreciation, which isn't a calculation, but if you're purchasing, uh, if you're hiring workers, purchasing physical capital, um, uh, purchasing natural resources, those are all numbers that you write down. So th that's what we mean by explicit costs. Okay, economic profits are equal to, or um, include 
also include implicit cost. Okay, and the, the term that we want to think about is the, op, the implicit cost we want to think about is the opportunity cost. So the basic definition of opportunity cost in economics is that it is the value of the next best next best alternative when a choice is made. Okay, so let's go back to um, one of our first examples concerning choice. Let's see if I can find that. Here it is. So here, here we have a consumer who's faced with a choice. And um, the consumer is going to allocate $10 to either good one or good two. And we know the prices of these things. $10 and $5. But we don't know the value. And we'll get to this later on in the semester. Um, actually, Chapter 3, we'll talk about the consumer value of a product is known as consumer or is known as willingness to pay for the product. Okay, and the idea, if you if you want to buy something, that means your willingness to pay for the product is greater than the actual price. So there's you're not going to buy anything if your willingness willingness to pay for Q1 is less than ten dollars and it's not worth it to you to buy the product. Okay, so if the wills to pay for Q1 is fifteen dollars, then that's greater than ten, and so you want to buy that product. Okay, if the willingness to pay for good two is equal to twelve dollars, two units of good two is equal to twelve dollars, and that's greater than the ten dollars that you would have to pay for the two units. And so you want that as well. Okay, so looking at these numbers, how are you going to allocate your $10? You're going to buy one unit of good one or uh, two units of good two. And I'll wait and listen to your answers. Hey, y'all got it. Yeah, so because the value of one unit of good one is greater than two units of good two, we're going to buy the single unit of good one. Okay, so what is the cost of good one in that case? Okay, a lot of times a beginning economic student is going to say, well, obviously the cost is $10. And your economics professor or instructor is going to say, no, nah, you got that wrong. How can you be so dumb? It's obvious that the $10 is just a price. Okay, the true cost of that choice is the opportunity cost. Okay, and the opportunity cost of good one is the value of your next best alternative, the thing that you could not get because of scarcity. And so the cost of good one is the value of two units of good two. And that's equal to twelve dollars. Okay, so how much better off is the consumer after making this all making this decision? Um, they are three dollars better off. They get a benefit of fifteen, and they incur a cost of twelve, and so um, they're three dollars better off as in terms of making this decision. Okay. OK, 
Okay, so to, to illustrate the concept of economic profit um, for a business firm, let's, let's look at a problem in the textbook. And I've got uh, um, <clears throat> my version 9 still, my ninth edition still. I'm on page 25, and I'm looking at number 14. And there is a business firm owner, and... Uh, the name is Jamie, which is gender neutral. Um, so Jamie, oh, but uh, the next term is considering <clears throat> leaving her current job, which pays $75,000 a year. Okay, so her current salary is $75,000. She wants to start a new company that develops applications for smartphones. Okay, based on market research, she can sell about 50,000 units during the, during the first year at a price of $4 per unit. So she thinks she can produce 50,000 units at a price of $4. Okay, and Jamie does not have uh, any market power. She's a price taker. She has to accept the price of $4 on the market. Okay, and uh, the next line says, with annual overhead costs and operating expenses amounting to $145,000, Jamie expects a profit margin of 20%. And uh, in economics, we, um, I mean, we'll talk about margins, profit margins at some point, but that last line is kind of a red herring. It's going to throw you off the scent of how to answer this question. Uh, we don't care if the profit margin is 20% or 10% or 100%. We're, we want to think about economic profit in terms of what kind of decision Jamie needs to make. Okay, then the next sentence is even worse. Throws you off even worse. This margin is 5% larger than that of her largest competitor. Okay, so she's got a great product. She's got a higher profit margin. Maybe she has lower cost. That's great, but uh, it's not going to help us answer the questions. Okay, so part A. If Jamie decides to embark on her new venture, what will her accounting cost be during the first year of operation? Okay, so accounting cost are the explicit cost that are incurred. And so that's equal to the 145 K. Okay. Okay, and then it says, well, what are her implicit costs? Okay, the implicit cost is the money that if Jamie makes a choice to quit her job and start a new business firm, it's the money that she has given up to start that firm. So the implicit cost is $75,000. Okay, and the opportunity cost is going to be equal to the accounting, which I should have mentioned above, is the explicit cost plus the implicit cost. So the accounting cost plus implicit cost equals opportunity cost, which is, like an economist would say, the true or the total cost. Or the, or the cost that should be uh, thought considered when making a decision. So this is 0, 1, 11, 2, 1. So that's $220,000 is the opportunity cost. So the opportunity cost in a business context Okay, is the explicit cost of um, something, let's call it a res of a resource, plus the implicit cost 
of giving up its next best alternative. Okay, so part B of this question asks us, suppose that Jamie's estimated selling price um, is lower than the original. Let's, let's, say it, let's do a uh, intermediate question here. A, okay, A prime. Jamie's accounting profit is going to be equal to total revenue, which is price times quantity. So that's 200,000 minus her explicit cost of 145,000. And so her accounting profit is greater than zero. So just like the uh, profit margin of 20%. Um, that's great. She's, she's making money. She's going to take home $55,000 at the end of the year and be able to go out and pay mortgage and buy food and clothes and have fun. And uh, the accounting profit is the money you take home. Okay, but the economic profit is going to be lower. The economic profit is 200,000 minus the economic cost, which is 220,000. And so economic profit is negative 20, is negative $20,000. So when you include the opportunity cost, Jamie's salary at her job, She's going to be losing $20,000 to take that job. So in a, if that's the way the world is going to be, there's going to be no economic changes. Jamie um, should look at the $55,000 she could um, make working for herself. Compare that to the $75,000 uh, she earns working for someone else and stay in her job. Okay, now that... That simple, that simple answer ignores a bunch of other stuff that uh, might be going on. Jamie might want to uh, work from home, work for herself, have flexible hours. Um, she might not like her boss or her coworkers, and she just wants to get out into a new line, new line of work. And so these simple calculations um, leave out a lot of stuff. Okay. Okay, so part B is a little bit curious. Suppose that Jamie's estimated selling price is lower than originally projected during the first year. Okay, lower than $4. How much revenue would she need in order to earn positive accounting profits? Well, the answer to that is pretty simple. You need at least $145,000 to earn positive accounting profits. Okay, so that's kind of a, a no-brainer. Um, and then you can do a little bit of math and figure out what that price is. Um, the, the, second, the second part of that question, how much revenue would she need in order to earn positive economic profits? That's a little bit more interesting because then we can do a break-even analysis and figure out the price that she needs to quit her job. So, so let's go back to our profit equation. Pri profit, profit equals price times quantity minus cost. And here our cost is 220000 Okay, we think we can sell, uh, we can produce up to 50,000 units. And so prices are unknown. And if we break even, then our profit is equal to zero. So a little bit of math here. Um, add 220 to both sides. Price times 50. Divide both sides by 50. 220 divided by 50. 
equals the break-even price. And it looked like looks like that's going to be uh, four dollars and forty cents. Okay, so Jamie's, if she really wants to quit her job and wants to maintain her standard of living, then she needs to figure out a way to increase the quality of her product or something else, or some other um, aspect of the product to raise the price to forty cents or raise the price by forty cents.